Hello, everyone. Today, Xiang Qian and I will give an introduction and deep dive for the Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group. My name is Xin Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm a co-chair of the CNCF Tech Storage, a co-chair of the Kubernetes Six Storage. I also co-lead the Data Protection Working Group with Xiang Qian. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiang Qian. I work in Google storage department. I lead the data protection working group with uh, Xin. Next slide, please. Uh, today, Xin and I will go through all these items in this agenda. We talk about why we are doing this working group and who are the organizations involved in this process and help building the data protection concept in Kubernetes. And then we'll talk about what exactly we want to achieve for data protection in Kubernetes and what are the existing building blocks that allows backup vendors or application owners to protect the valuable assets. And Shin will talk about missing building blocks in the community we're looking to define or provide to further bring the availability to backup vendors or application owners to protect the workload. And last edition, we'll get into how can you get involved. Next slide, please. The day one operations for stateful workload as of today in Kubernetes is kind of well-defined. Uh, first of all, there's a very mature persistent volume operations supported either via CSI or in-tree plugins that allows stateful workloads to use a persistent volume layer. On top of that, there are workload APIs which uses the persistent volume to define workloads. Some of them are deployments, some of them are step forces, et cetera. Uh, with the strong desire of moving to a container orchestrated architecture for stateful workload, there, there is a deep requirement in terms of how can I protect my data should disaster happens. And unfortunately at this moment, the day two operations for protecting those workloads in Kubernetes is still insufficient. Uh, some of the organizations or backup vendors utilizes GitOps, but GitOps can only protect the application definitions, basically the YAML files, but not necessarily the persistent volume data that is typically managed by the underlying storage system. Given all that, we build the data protection working group, try to define in this uh, define a solution in this scope. Next slide, please. So who are involved? There are many, many organizations involved actively in this data protection working group. And here are all the companies. Uh, if you feel I miss someone, miss some, some of you, please feel free to reach out and we will add. Next slide, please. So what exactly is data protection in Kubernetes? First of all, let me just explain from really high level what's the main goal. The main goal is to enable an application owner or a cluster administrator or a backup. Uh, typically in a big organization, there's a backup administrator such that any valuable assets running in the Kubernetes environment can be restored to a pre previously preserved state should any, disaster, should any disaster happen. It can be loss of the cluster, loss of the storage system, et cetera, et cetera. And to define that in the Kubernetes context, it mainly involves two pieces. One, 
is the API resources that constitute an application or compose internet application. The other piece is the persistent volume data that application relies on. This is a complicated and later problem um, that basically means it includes backup and restore at the persistent volume level, application level, and further down to namespace and cluster level. Next slide, please. So part of our working group's charter is to define what are the components needed to support all these backup and restore operations. So uh, at, of course, at different levels, persistent volume level, like volume snapshot and how to backup the volume and how do you restore a volume. And the application level, what consists to an application? What, what are the resources needed by an application? And in some uh, uh, cases, application wants to be application consistent when a backup is created and mechanic them to quiet and unquiet an application such that no more rights is accepted during that process also needs to be supported. And further to a bigger scope, how we do this in a namespace and a cluster level. Next slide, please. Here are some common use cases we gathered in that protection uh, working group. Right, a typical one can be, I as an application owner, I want to protect my application to cover common failures. For example, I wrote out a bad software. I want to roll it back with exactly the same configs I used to have, as well as the data I used to have. Another example for that, Personnel is personnel. It's basically I want to migrate in between namespaces, in between clusters, and even across different availability zones. Another one is standing from the URI cluster administrator's point of view. They want to protect the namespaces running in their cluster as single units. So they want to protect provide data protection over a namespace level. And finally, another big case is, I, as a data protection administrator in an organization, I don't really quite know the little details, what kind of workloads is running in each Kubernetes cluster, but I also want to enforce organization policies around those workloads or, the, or around those clusters. So how do we provide uh, the utilities so that backup vendors can kick in and build those solutions for them, it's also critical. Next slide, please. So we're talking about the definition. Let's try to see what a typical an application will backup. This is really a very high level view. So uh, we talk about two pieces. Kubernetes resources, as well as the persistent volume, back, uh, persistent volume data. The user kicks off a backup, and the first, the, the two things will happen. First thing is to gather all the resources that composes a specific an application or namespace or cluster, and ship it externally, typically, uh, to a secondary object storage system or a secondary storage system. And the other piece is to back up the persistent volume data. Because there are many, many applications and they have different flavors of doing things. So in this process, it can well be an application specific native data dump, for example, MySQL dump or Postgres dump. Or it can well rely on existing Kubernetes components like control, controller coordinated volume snapshot process and a, a volume back or volume backup process with the quiet and unquiet hooks so that it can achieve application consistent. And after this is done, the volume data, a volume snapshot will be copied as well as to an externally managed backup repository. 
In this case, the application can safely claim uh, that their data and the config has been stored in an externally managed system that has not tied to the cluster an application is running on. Next slide, please. Let's go to how the restore will happen. A user starts a restoration process, should any, if it's needed, which imports a backup, including data and a config from an externally managed storage system. And this process will also take place in two pieces. One is to restore the Kubernetes resources, which consists consists the application. And uh, the other piece is to restore the PV PVC data. Of course, this will need a specific PVC data restoration process. And it also depends on the na uh, nature of the application. For example, if it's a native one, <clears throat> there are tools that the native uh, the application will provide to restore the data into the format they want it. Or a Kubernetes controller managed process, which just backed up by, backed by restoring a PV or PVC from a snapshot or worm backup. Next slide, please. So in order to achieve all this, <clears throat> excuse, we need a lot of building blocks. And there are already some existing ones in the community. The, for application, to figure out the application, what resources are needed to backup. There are workload APIs like stateful set, deployment, et cetera. And there are also application CRDs. To restore and backup a volume, the components like volume snapshot features, which, are, uh, which is already G8, can be used as well. The thing over here is we are still having a lot of missing building blocks. We'll cover this later by C. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now let's see how this will be used. Recall that we need to define basically a group of resources that constitute an application. And that's where the workload APIs or SIG apps application CRD can work, uh, can help. Uh, typically, this is achieved by a label query or, or within the namespace to get all the resources that consist of the, the, uh, the, the application. Next slide, please. For the volume backup piece, the volume snapshots feature plays a good role over here because volume snapshot typically is really, really fast. Uh, to uh, and the, for many storage vendors, the implementation is just the internal marker of the current state, and that allows the application to freeze and unfreeze themselves in a short, very short period of time, like in a millisecond level. Uh, worm snapshot feature can be used to plug in into the worm backup process. Next slide, please. But and in the restoration process, very similar way, the volume snapshot can be used to rehydrate a PVC such that the PV will contain the data that when the volume snapshot was taken. Next slide, please. By saying that, we're still missing a lot. For example, volume backup. How do we do a volume backup? because worm snapshot in many implementations is a local, still stored locally on the local storage system. How do we expose uh, export the worm snapshot out? We really need a worm backup module. Like where do we store the backups? Where do we store the config, the applica uh, application API resources and the worm data? Uh, how do we do acquires? How do we trigger acquires against the specific application? Uh, and how do we coordinate the application snapshot or application backup process, which includes backing up the config, backing up the volume, 
uh, before backing up the volume may be quiet and unquiet as well. Next slide, please. So putting things together, uh, this is again, a really high level view. The blue pieces are the workflow and the green pieces are what is already there. And the yellow pieces are in progress and the orange pieces are still to be designed or discussed. So given this whole picture, we need something that can coordinate uh, an application's resource, uh, resource backup as well as data backup. We need a place where the backup will be restored, will be stored. It's called a backup repository. I put the name over there. And we need something to really back up the volumes, which is a volume backup com uh, component. Uh, the quiet and the unquiet hooks, there's an ongoing cap. Uh, Shin will get more details into that. It's called container notify. Uh, in the restore workflow, next slide, please. Up. Similar thing. So the backup repository needs to play when a backup is imported. And some application restore come API to coordinate or orchestrate the whole restoration process. And then finally, the volume backup module, which can import the back volume data into the, the Kubernetes cluster. With that, I will hand it over to Shin to discuss all the missing components. Thanks, Shangqian. The first missing building block we identified is volume backup. We need this because we need to extract data to your secondary storage. We've already got a volume snapshot API, but there's no explicit definition made in the design to have snapshots stored on a different backup device, separate from the primary storage. For some cloud providers, a snapshot is actually a backup that is uploaded to an object store in the cloud. However, for most other storage vendors, a snapshot is locally stored alongside the volume on the primary storage. Without a volume backup API, the alternative is for backup vendors to have two solutions for storage systems that upload snapshots to object store automatically, a snapshot is a backup. For storage systems that only take local snapshots, use volume snapshot API to take snapshot and then have a data mover to upload snapshot to our backup device. We are at a very early stage of discussions for this one. Let's take a look of this diagram. Volume backup is next to volume snapshot here. We put it in an orange box to indicate that it is a missing Kubernetes component. We have started discussions but there's no concrete design yet. The next missing building block is CBT, change block tracking and the change file list. Without CBT and change file list, backup vendors have to do full backups all the time. This is not space efficient, takes longer time to complete and needs more bandwidth. Another use case is snapshot based replication where you take snapshots periodically and replicate to another site for disaster recovery purpose. So what are the alternatives? Without CBT, we can either do full backups or call each storage vendor's API individually to retrieve CBT, which is highly inefficient. We are currently working on our design for this feature. Let's take a look at this diagram. The CPT box is next to volume backup and volume snapshot as it is used to make backups more efficiently. It is in a yellow box indicating this is a work in progress component. The third missing building block is the backup repository. Backup repository is a location or repo to store data. This can be an object store in the cloud, on-prem object location, or it could be NFS-based solution. 
there are two types of data to be backed up that we need at restore time. The first one is Kubernetes cluster metadata. The second is local snapshot data. We need to back them up and store them in a backup repository. Currently, there is a proposal for object store backup repository. That's the proposal for object bucket provisioning or COSI. It proposes uh, object storage Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. Therefore, bring in object storage as the first class citizen in Kubernetes, just like file and block storage. It also introduces container object storage interface, or COSI, as a set of gRPC interfaces for object storage providers to red drivers to provision or provide access to object stores. Kubernetes COSI is already a subproject in SIG storage. It has weekly design meetings. It's targeting alpha in 1.23 release. Let's take a look of this diagram. COSI is in a yellow box indicating that this is a work in progress Kubernetes component. This is a object store backup repository. It can be used to export backup and store the data. Now let's take a look of restore. COSI is used to import backup data at the restore time. The next missing building block is volume populator. Without volume populator, we can only create a PVC from another PVC or from a volume snapshot. But what if the backed up data is stored in a backup repository, such as an object store? The volume populator feature allows us to provision a PVC from an external data source, such as a backup repository. In addition, it allows us to dynamically provision a PVC, having data populated from that backup repository, and honor the wait for first consumer volume binding mode during restore to ensure that volume is placed at the right node where a pod is scheduled. There is an any volume data source alpha feature gate, which was introduced in 1.18, and we had a redesign in 1.22 release. There are repos created for a shared library for volume populators and another repo for a controller that is responsible for validating PVC data source. We will have our very first release from those repos very soon. And this feature is targeting beta in 1.23 release. Let's take a look of this diagram. We can see that volume populator is needed at the restore time. Volume populator, populator is in the yellow box, indicating it is a work in progress Kubernetes component. It is used to rehydrate PVC from a backup repository during restore. The next one is quiet and unquiet hooks. We need these hooks to quiet application before taking a snapshot and unquiet afterwards to ensure application consistency. We investigated how quiet unquiet works in different types of workloads. They have different semantics. We want to design a generic mechanism to run commands in containers, but we want to mention that application-specific semantics is out of scope. We currently have a proposal called Container Notifier can be submitted and being reviewed. We are targeting alpha in 1.23 release. So here are some details of the container notifier cap. We are doing this in phases. In phase one, we propose to introduce several API changes. We're going to add an optional field called notifiers, which is a list of container notifiers into the container. Adding an inline type container notifier handler, which defines a command. Adding a core API type pod notification 
which defines request type to trigger execution of container notifiers in a pod. Introduce a new gate container notifier to toggle this feature. And a single trusted controller, pod notification controller will be implemented to watch pod notification resources, execute the command and update their statuses accordingly. And in phase two, we propose to add a core cool API notification type and a controller which processes notification resources and add a inline port definition for signals and allows the API ob object to send a request to trigger delivering of those signals. More logic in a, no uh, in a pod notification controller in Kubelet. Kubelet watches pod notification objects runs the command and updates, updates statuses of pod notification objects accordingly. In phase three, a probe may be added if needed as an inline pod definition to verify the signal is delivered or whether the command is run and results in the desired outcome. As shown in this diagram, container notifier is mainly used at backup time to do quiet before taking the snapshot and unquiet afterwards. The next one is consistent group snapshot. So we talked about the container notifier proposal, which tries to ensure application consistency. What if we can acquire the application or if the application quiet is too expensive so you want to do it less frequently, but still want to be able to take crash consistent snapshot more frequently. Also an application may require the snapshots from multiple volumes to be taken at the same point in time. That's when consistent group snapshot comes into the picture. There is a cap on volume group and group snapshot. It proposes to introduce a new volume group CRD that groups multiple volumes together and a new group snapshot CRD that supports taking a snapshot of all volumes in a group to ensure right order consistency. The cap is being reviewed. Let's take a look of this diagram. We don't have a container notifier to do quiet here, but we have a consistent group snapshot that facilitates the creation of a snapshot of multiple volumes in the same group to ensure right order consistency. We have snapshot APIs for individual volumes, but what about protecting a stateful application? There is a cap submitted that proposes a Kubernetes API that defines the notion of stateful applications and defines how to run operations on those stateful applications, such as snapshot, backup, and restore. This is still in very early design stage. As shown in this diagram, application backup handles the backup of a stateful application. It can leverage container notifier to do quiet and use COSI as backup repository. Similarly here, we can have application restore that handles the restore of a stateful application. So these are all the missing building blocks that we have identified and are working on. Next, I'm going to talk about how to get involved. As discussed in previous slides, the data protection working group is working on identifying missing functionalities in supporting data protection in Kubernetes and trying to figure out how to fill those gaps. We are also working on a white paper on data protection workflow. We have bi weekly meetings on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. If you are interested in joining the discussions, you are welcome to join our meetings. We also have a mailing list and a Slack channel as shown here. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you all for attending the session. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Bye.